recording. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to for today's uh, seminar at the Department of Marine Sciences. And we are very happy to host uh, Dr. Yael Edelman Furstenberg from the Geological Survey of Israel. Um, Yael, some background about uh, her education and training. So Yael has a bachelor from the uh, Ben Gurion University in the Negev, where she finished it in 19, 1994. And then she moved to Jerusalem to the Hebrew University. Um, and she finished the master in 97 which uh, she worked on a paleogeographic setting during the late of, of Holocene in Central Red Sea. Then, <clears throat> um, PhD she did in uh, paleoecology and paleontology at the University of Chicago in Illinois, in the United States, where she worked on um, reconstruction of high productivity marine settings um, using benthic uh, paleoecology and taphonomy of uh, Cretaceous Michel formation, working with Professor Susan Kidwell. Um, then uh, <coughs> she came back to Israel as a research scientist at the Geological Survey of Israel and became the head of the stratigraphy and subsurface department. And she had a short visit of one year at the Institute of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Duluth Rutgers in the United States. And um, her interests are uh, ancient and modern marine environment, conservation and paleobiology, paleoecology, and taphonomy of skeletal, <coughs> skeletal remains, uh, mainly mollusks, right? So uh, today, Yael is going to talk about tracking, tracking long and short term ecological changes on the Israeli Mediterranean shelf. And with this word, I pass the uh, podium to you, uh, Yael. And okay. the podium is yours. Okay, so um, hello. Um, glad to see everyone, even though it's uh, through Zoom. Um, today, I will be talking about uh, how we can put the very young fossil record to work in order to understand the processes that are shaping the benthic uh, communities on seafloors today. And so, uh, marine environments are affected by both natural processes and uh, human impact. And uh, these both can cause changes in the ecosystem structure and function. If you see here, we see a map that uh, shows the, the uh, marine seafloor that there's um, virtually no place um, that is left that did not go under some sort of human uh, um, influence, human impact. And, um, and these uh, challenges in the ecological assessment and restoration uh, should be asked, we should ask questions if we want to assess these, uh, these changes and if we want to restore uh, ecosystems back to where they were, to how they were, or, or if we don't. So important questions that, that we ask are, has the system, has the ecological system changed? So that means um, which species, which functional groups have been lost? We also want to know what drove the, the change. And so we want to know which, which stressors we need to reduce or maybe to improve, or if we don't want to, to do anything. And uh, an important question is, is what was natural? What is natural for the ecological system? So we, we want to see the composition and structure of the ecological systems that are unaltered. So I mean that, um, what we mean is that we want to see how these systems looked before man uh, made any uh, changes, before the influence of uh, anthropogenic um, processes. And so historic perspectives are very important for recognizing these change. We can diagnose the cause and we can set targets if we want to restore. Okay, and so especially today, it's very important to understand how to track these uh, changing environments. And so ecological studies examine the living community today. And by doing that, they show a snapshot of who, of, of what the community, um, of what of the, the fauna living today look like. And so if the, if the uh, sampling was done uh, a week before a storm, the assemblage that, that they look at will look 
uh, a specific way. If they, if um, if ecologists go a week after a storm, the the fauna that they that they will uh, see will look uh, will look different. If they go before a reproduction cycle, they will get an assemblage um, that looks one way. But if they go maybe a month after uh, the re a reproduction uh, uh, season, they will get a different assemblage. And so it's like you get a snapshot of who is living um, that day that you went to sample or that season or that year. And uh, what paleoecologists do, uh, and I'm a, I'm a paleoecologist, um, is we put the time dimension into these samples. And so what we do is we uh, look at time averaged samples uh, in order to get a multi-generation of species assemblages so that we can look and see the patterns of local um, colonization or local extinction, and we can relate this later to environmental changes. And so by putting the time into, uh, into the ecology, we get time averaged uh, assemblages. And it's very important today to generate robust and quantitative data on communities of the recent past. And in order to do that, um, we, we look at death assemblages. Now, uh, it's important so that we can have a baseline. The death assemblage give us a baseline that we can compare our biological uh, monitoring or our biological studies to what the community looked like, what the eco ecological status was before man inter interfered. And so um, we can know uh, the, the um, the 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 health state of a of a, a community, the health state of an ecological system, by looking at the range of what the ecological system looked, uh, 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 what the ecological system saw um, throughout its uh, its life. And so, um, to get this historic perspective, we look at death assemblages. And so, what are death assemblages? Um, living uh, living benthic organisms. They live on the seafloor, and after they die, they die. Their skeletal remains, their shells, um, um, are preserved on the top sediment. Okay, so we have on the seafloor, we have a mixed layer um, of of, of uh, mud that um, all the animals that have a hard shell, when they die, they they uh, they leave their shell on the seafloor, and so we have multi generation. We have we have a multi generation of accumulation of um, shells. And these are all time average because the mixed layer goes through um, bioturbation, uh, it sees uh, currents, storms, and so there's mixing of the top layer, which obliterates, um, it makes a mess of all the, of all the seasonal changes of uh, was there a storm or not, did I take this sample before or after a reproduction cycle. It gives us, a, a, it smooths out everything. It gives us a, a, a time average mixed layer that is actually more complete than one biological census that we would go and take on a specific day. And so this sample, they capture the composition and community structure of the local community um, that, that lives in that place to a very high degree because every um, animal that was alive there and dies and leaves a shell will be in this time average death assemblage. Now, these death assemblages can act as a baseline for evaluating the recent change that we want to see if happened or not. And so the death assemblage can actually give us the range of what the ecological system can see uh, within the past 10, 20 years. And so we get one, uh, one uh, point that gives us the whole uh, history of what the ecological system can see. And then if we see today, that we have a specific assemblage, we can see if we are between the range of what this system sees. And so we can know today, are we in a catastrophe or not? Or did the, it, did the ecological system see these changes that we are seeing today? And then we know that we are in the norm of what the system sees. And so how much is this time averaging that I'm talking about? The um, uh, other, other people, uh, work of other people had, um, uh, age, age dating. Wait, let me get this anyway. The age dating of uh, dead shells in the seabed um, using either um, amino acid restimulation or radiocarbon cal and, and calibrated with it. They they show that 
there is a persistent pattern of strongly skewed age of frequency distributions, meaning that in every sample that I take, most shells that I pick up are going to be young. So if we take a shell from the top of the seafloor, from the first few centimeters of the, of the mud on the seafloor, um, if we're on a shelf, if we're on a, on a marine shelf, it's going to be a shell that died within the past few tens of years, 10, 20, 30. We're not talking about geological uh, uh, times, we're talking about the recent past. And then, um, of course, there will be some shells that are much older, but they are the rare shells in the sample. And so, And so um, how faithful is the composition of this dead assemblage to the living one in the place? Um, and so um, we shouldn't be concerned about this because there is a very high live dead agreement in the species relative abundance and in the species composition. And so, every, and so if we look at the top sediment, at dead assemblage of the past few tens of years, we are actually capturing the community that lives in this uh, ecological system. And so species that are dominant dead also tend to be dominant alive. And species that are rare dead will either be absent or will also be rare alive. Um, and um, this, this is true um, when, when, the, when the ecological system didn't go uh, through any disruption. And so um, in order to focus more, how, how big is the ecological change um, or how, what, what is the magnitude of an ecological change, we can conduct what's called a live dead study. And so we take a quantitative, okay, we, we count um, shells. We take the quantitative comparison of um, species that occur both live and dead in modern environments. And we test, is the living community the same as the dead? as the death assemblage, okay? And we look at the richness, the abundance, how many species there are, how much of each species, what, what trophic level, how they, where do they, um, where do they uh, live? Um, what kind of uh, food uh, um, strategy do they have, a feeding strategy? And we look at all this community structure in both the living assemblage, in the living animals, and in the skeletal debris in the death assemblage. And we take this from the same, uh, the same sample. And so we actually use very little, uh, we, we kill very, a, a small amount of live, of live uh, um, uh, taxa. And, uh, and, to, and in this way, we can see if there is a live dead match. So the dead assemblage actually captures what the living community uh, is seeing. But if there, and there was a meta-analysis done on shelves from all over around the world, that show that if there is a live dead mismatch, then that is associated with anthropogenic change. And so if we see that the living community is very different than the top sediment, we know that man has interfered. Okay, and so um, if we wanna see the utility of the death assemblages, we wanna understand why they're important. I'll just summarize that uh, the, the shells are a main component of shallow uh, seafloor sediments. And these uh, shallow sediments are actually the area which is most prone to human, act, to human impact on the marine uh, shelf. They, uh, the, the, the shelly faunal groups leave a historic or geological record in the sediment. And they can be used as a baseline for biological monitoring. And this way we can, we can uh, give a marine health state of the area by uh, taking the, the um, samples that we see today, the living community, and comparing to the death assemblage. Are they the same or are they very different? Okay, and so um, why do we use mollusks as environmental indicators? Uh, mollusks are a dominant component of uh, shelf sediments. They have a very wide range of species and very diverse habitats. They go from freshwater to uh, the saltiest waters. Uh, they're very sensitive recorders of seafloor conditions, and so they can track oxygen or food availability on the seafloor. They can track uh, differences in water energies. And of course, they track the substrate changes. Um, is okay, and um, they're widely used to assess impacted environments. And of course, they're important because they leave historic records. They have shells that we can uh, look 
and find on the seafloor. So um, we wanted to assess the rate and magnitude of change in the Israeli Mediterranean that is associated with human stressors in, um, in the recent past. And so if we track the fate of mollusk populations, we're actually tracking a major component of macrobenthos. And that in this way, we can, we can um, see how the environment changed. And so we used, uh, we, we used death assemblages to differentiate between the natural Ecolo ecological state and anthropogenic changes. And then we, you, we did a live dead study to see if we can follow the magnitude of how much, um, what, what is the magnitude of ecological change. Okay, and so um, there were many, uh, many parameters that, are, are, that impact the Israeli shelf, but if we look at the, the two main factors that, that uh, changed in the past uh, maybe 200 years, um, at large in the Eastern Mediterranean. So the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 um, introduced a massive uh, invasion of Red Sea fauna to the Mediterranean, termed the Lesepsian migration. And this was a very big change of two seas that were uh, separated millions of years that now um, uh, have a connection. And this uh, Lesepsian migration um, actually shows that the mollusks are one of the major uh, faunal groups that, that are seen to, to have invasive species. They're about 40% of uh, invasive species on the seafloor. But, uh, but of course, other groups um, also, also show this uh, invasion. And uh, another uh, important factor that, that humans changed in this area, which uh, had a very big effect on the Eastern Mediterranean, is the construction of the Aswan Dam on the Nile River, um, which uh, um, the, the Nile River was the, was the most important river flowing into the Eastern Mediterranean. It brought with it uh, sediments and a lot of nutrients, a lot of food for this uh, for for the the fauna uh, on in the sea. And uh, in 1964, the high dam was constructed, and then there was a practically um, a decrease a very, very big, big decrease of, uh, of sediments uh, entering the Eastern Mediterranean and it cut off all the nutrient supply from the Nile River into the um, Eastern Mediterranean, which is an oligotrophic uh, ocean, I'm sure you all know, which is uh, very poor in nutrients to begin with. <clears throat> and so these two major, um, major uh, anthropogenic uh, factors were very interesting for us to see um, how we can uh, track we can track these, how, how did it affect the, the uh, living communities on the seafloor? How did it affect the biodiversity? How did it affect the whole community structure of animals on the seafloor? And so we chose a sampling site uh, at, um, across the, uh, um, off Helcilia at 60 meters water depth. And this site was chosen uh, specifically because it was um, far away from any known uh, source point of pollution um, in the area, because we want to see the, the large picture of how the Eastern Mediterranean is, is, uh, um, is changing in the past uh, few decades. And so information on the past 150 years of this globally growing human influence is very rare because it's, it's, there are no sedimentary records that are also age-based. People look at the, at the uh, recent past, but they don't know exactly where they are uh, in the sedimentary record. They don't know if, we're, uh, if they're five years ago or if they're uh, looking at a process that happened 50 years ago. Um, and so it's very important to have age-based sediments that we can work. And so, um, so we took uh, um, at this station, we took another uh, core right next to where we took a big box core for the fano. We took um, a long uh, gravity core. And we looked at the lead 210 uh, chronology using the alpha spectrometry um, because it's uh, um, more accurate than the gamma spectrometry. Um, we used uh, um, uh, a protocol that I had uh, uh, just uh, uh, finished uh, doing in, in Eilat, in the Gulf of Eilat, which worked uh, very well. We use only the fine fraction of the sediment, the, the smaller than 63 microns, in order to concentrate the uh, lead to the lead that's in the sediment. And that way we can get a longer profile 
of uh, and a more accurate profile of um, of the sediment. And we did this uh, using the NIOS laboratories in the Netherlands, and I worked there with my uh, colleague uh, Henko Destinko. And so uh, this is the is the core. We see that uh, on the bottom, of course, there's a um, fine grained, and then we move up in the top 20 centimeters, it becomes more sandy. Um, we have we, we found a sedimentation rate of about a third of a centimeter per year. And um, I can talk about this later if anyone has a question. We use the model fit uh, without a, a sediment mixed layer because of the specific, uh, um, the specific uh, parameters that were at this station. Now, um, here we can already put uh, uh, dates and we see that uh, it was actually 2018. I don't know why I put 2017. And the uh, and the bottom of the core at 84 centimeters is uh, the beginning of of the revolution of the um, uh, uh, the revolution of the Tassi. I forgot the word in English now. Um, and uh, that's in uh, in 1750. And we could also put a, um, a date on uh, when the Aswan Dam. Was, uh, was constructed. So that's at around 17 centimeters down core. And the opening of the Suez Canal was uh, at around 47 uh, uh, centimeters uh, down core. And so now uh, we looked also at uh, general parameters of the, of the sediment. And so we see here that there's a coarsening, uh, a coarsening of the grain size as we go up core. Um, we can see that there's a very big change after the end of the Little Ice Age, which we also captured in our core. Um, and we see that uh, this coarsening goes together with the, uh, the, um, the uh, concentration of, of uh, quartz and also a decrease in the phyllosilicate. Okay, so there's a transition from the fine, the clay component to a coarser component, which is sandy and increasing in quartz. And this, we can see the same trend we can see when we looked at the, at the chemistry. I'm just bringing a few of the data here because this is, a, this is something that, we're, um, that I'm working with colleagues at the Geological Survey. It's, and, and we're still in the, in the middle of uh, analyzing all the data. And so um, here we see the same, the same trend. We see at the end of the Little Ice Age, there's an, uh, an increase in the silica component um, together with a decrease in the alumina component. And when we look at the total organic carbon in the sediment, meaning the, the food, the nutrients that, are, that we can look at in the sediment, we see that after the uh, construction of the Aswan Dam that actually decreased the, 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 um, river, the, the Nile River input into the Eastern Mediterranean, we see that we have a decrease in the total organic carbon. Okay, and, and if we look at the minor elements that we looked, I just brought a few just to show that also um, there is a, a general decrease in uh, most of the trace elements uh, together with the decrease in the aluminous fraction and, uh, and the chrome is doing something that's opposite. We don't understand that yet. And so um, the, ma the main point of, of uh, the project was to look at the, human, the history of human impact in the past 150 years using the, the death assemblages that I find using the fauna to tell me what happened to the ecology in the Eastern Mediterranean on the sea. Floor. And so we took the, the research vessel, the Bat Galim, and we used the large box core that's 50 centimeters um, uh, across and also can penetrate 50 centimeters deep into the, into the uh, seafloor. And here, um, now, finally, we had a time constraint on these samples that we're gonna look at. So, so every layer that we looked at, we know um, what time uh, it's relevant for. And so uh, Hadal, my, my student, uh, she just finished her master's. She looked at all the death assemblages at all the Shelley components that were within uh, these sediments. And um, we took special care to look and see um, uh, uh, how the living community, how the living assemblage today um, relates to samples that are after this one high dam was constructed before it was constructed and after the Suez Canal was opened. And uh, we were just lucky that the that 50 centimeters, which is the penetration depth of the core, um, was exactly a day before the, um, the Suez Canal was opened. And so our first sample was actually, is, actually gives us the story of what happened here before the invasion uh, from the Red Sea. 
Okay, and so we looked at death assemblages from this large black score. We, um, uh, we, we sampled all the molluscan shells that we found. We see here we have, a, a, we, we, uh, we sieve it through, we sieve the mud through a two millimeter sieve. Uh, we took duplicate large uh, back scores, and um, and now we know that they represent the the past 150, 160 years um, of of history in the Eastern Mediterranean. We looked at 20 samples, and we identified all the taxonomic. Uh, we we identified all the taxa to species level, or uh, or um, at least to genus level. And so we found about 90 species of bivalves and gastropods. And this was from over 4,000 um, individuals. And, um, and here we see that the two duplicate uh, um, box scores. And if we look at here, we see the depth on the y-axis. And on the um, x-axis, we see the relative abundance of the most uh, dominant species in the, in the box score. We see that actually the trend is very similar in both box scores. Um, oops. Um, and, and this way we were confident that we are seeing um, a true story. Okay, and uh, if we look at the trophic levels, meaning the bivalve uh, lifestyle or um, their feeding types, we can see also if we look, uh, if we look at the history, at the long-term history and the 50 uh, centimeters of the core in the past 150 years, we can see that the, in, the epifauna species, meaning that they, um, settle on the seafloor and don't burrow inside the mud, um, they increase up core. If we look at feeding types of the bivalves and gastropods, we see that there's a very big change going up core. The bivalves, um, they're the main component of the deposit feeders bivalves, which are uh, bivalves that eat, um, that, that, eat uh, uh, the, the, that go through the mud, they churn the mud and eat the organic matter that's uh, in, in the sediment, as opposed to uh, bivalves that um, that uh, take the suspension that's in the water and feed that way, and so we see that all the deposit feeders are um, are in the bottom part of the core. And after the Aswan Dam was constructed, constructed, we see that there are no more uh, deposit feeders. And also, there's a very big change in the gastropod feeding type here on the right hand side. We see that they there was. Um, a dominant uh, carnivore, uh, um, uh, car carnivorous gastropods, and then today they're almost they they almost uh, disappeared, and today we have only non-carnivore species. Now, if we if we see if we take, for instance, the gastropod this assemblage, and we look at the long at the long uh, the long-term changes that we see in the past hundred and fifty years, we see that. In the first sample, and I'm most in the bottom of the sea floor, in the bottom of the core, we see that there is a, a species called Tritia varicosa, and it was almost 60% of the assemblage. And today, today it went up to zero, as opposed to a different a different gastropod that was absent. It was zero at the bottom of the core, and today it is almost 80% uh, of the of the um, assemblage today. And this goes together with uh, these, these species are the ones that are responsible for the trophic uh, uh, difference of carnivorous gastropods that changed to um, non-carnivorous. Now, I'm just uh, stressing the point that if we had looked only at the top sediment, okay, and we say that the top sediment is actually a mirror of who is living there today, we would get a, a picture that is not what happened in in the Eastern Mediterranean, we would say, "Oh, today there are no no more um, carnivorous gastropods. There is no more tritia, and we only have this Varicopeza uh, poxila." And if we we do the same thing with the bivalves, we see that um, in the bottom of the of the core, in the lower part of the core, we have many deposit feeders, and then in the top part of the core, we have a mixed feeder, which is called Abra uh, Abra longicalus. And if we only looked at, uh, at what happened after the, the Nile was, uh, after the Aswan Dam was uh, constructed, we would get a different picture of what actually happened uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And this goes together with looking at the TOC. Of course, when there's more um, total organic carbon in the sediment, we have more deposit feeders because that's what they eat. 
And then higher up after the, the nutrients stopped, um, uh, stopped uh, uh, coming into the Eastern Mediterranean, we have a different assemblage. And so if here we look at this Varicopeza, this species that was actually zero at the bottom of the core, and we put, we put our, time, our time constraints on it, we know that here was uh, the construction of the Aswan Dam. Uh, this is a, uh, this, this actually shows us the Mediterranean invasion of the species that today um, is, is the most dominant gastropod and is almost, uh, is more than 30% of the whole mollusca assemblage. And so here we can actually, for the first time, follow the invasion into the, into the uh, Mediterranean by looking at the magnitude at the, at the process itself. And uh, if we look today, at, uh, at this uh, species, we see that it's um, very dominant, doesn't matter what season we take. And so there was a big uh, ecological change that uh, happened at 60 meters in the Eastern Mediterranean. And we can look at it now because we have a time constraint and on our uh, sediment. And so if we take, um, if we do a cluster analysis, which means that we take all the relative abundance of all the species of all the fauna that we found from all the, uh, samples and we we uh, we we put it uh, in. Um, we, we take all this information together and we look to see which two samples are more close to each other than are different than each other, which are more similar than are dissimilar, and that way we can group together the uh, samples themselves using biological information. And so here we have uh, three clusters, uh, which one cluster we could also divide into two. So we have five clusters that. Uh, are based on the biological information of the shells, of the, the fauna that live in each, um, in, in this area. And again, if we put the, the time, we see that uh, here in the NMDS, which is just looking at the same information as if it were on a map, okay? So, so the, the samples here um, are, are the different samples. And if they uh, cluster together, that means that they are more similar to each other than they are to the next cluster. And so, we see that um, the clusters that uh, here, the cluster uh, C uh, Tagaim is the one before the construction of the, the, the uh, Suez Canal, before the opening of the Suez Canal. And that's very different than all the other clusters. And the cluster that here we have today is very, the, the cluster of the recent past is very different than the clusters before. And so if we take this information, we can ask another very interesting question. Um, the, um, about a, a phenomena called uh, nanism, which is uh, dwarfism in the Mediterranean. It's a, it's a phenomena that we find smaller body sizes of the same species um, in the Eastern Mediterranean as compared to their counterpart in the Western uh, Mediterranean. Okay, and this, um, th this uh, has many theories, but uh, uh, mostly it might be the result of uh, environmental factors. Okay, so because of the very low productivity, if you, hear, if you see here on the map to the right, we see that the Eastern Mediterranean is dark blue, which means that it's very oligotrophic, very low in nutrients, as opposed to the Western Mediterranean, which has uh, the, the yellow and red colors. Oh, it's your yeah, okay. um, We can hear you, Beverly, hello. Um, and so, uh, um, and so we see that the Western Mediterranean is very um, high nutrients as opposed to the Eastern Mediterranean. And also there's a difference in the, uh, the, uh, um, the water temperatures, okay? And so the Eastern Mediterranean is very high water temperature. The, the water temperature, the surface water temperature is extremely high as opposed to the Western part of the Mediterranean, which has lower um, uh, temperatures. Now this lateral difference, um, that we see from the east to the west, we wanted to know if we can see this actually in a temporal uh, perspective, looking down core, because in our core, we have higher nutrients down the core and lower nutrients up on the top. And maybe we can um, see this, uh, this uh, nanism also by us. And so Hadal checked the body size changes with time. So she took um, all, the, all, the, uh, all the clusters of of the, all the biological groups that we found. And she looked at the body sizes and saw that actually, if we um, look at the, at the total organic carbon within each group of samples, 
we can see that there is a lowering of the total organic carbon from downcore to today. And we see that this goes together with a significant, um, with a significant uh, uh, decrease in the body size of the animal. And so we think that we capture this nanism that is seen laterally, we also capture this temporally. And so just um, to sum up what we see here by looking at the disassemblages in the, in the um, uh, box score. So we see that uh, going from the bottom here, that is the pre-Suez uh, pre canal uh, assemblages, we can see a very big shift in the gastropods. We see that the, that the, uh, um, uh, the, the species that were here in the Mediterranean for millions of years are now almost gone. Right? We see this blue that's almost gone, and we see this uh, uh, pink, which is the invasive uh, gastropod that now is the major gastropod uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean at 60 meters. And we see this also in the bivalves. There, um, we see that um, the purple colors, which are the uh, deposit feeders, are here on the bottom of the, uh, of the core. But when we go higher up core and the nutrients stop uh, entering the Mediterranean, they, uh, they disappear. On the other hand, we have the blue uh, um, mixed feeder, which is the abra. With, uh, this is a, um, uh, a bivalve that knows how to take the opportunity of uh, also deposit feeding and suspension feeding. And so when, um, when uh, things get rough, it knows how to change its feeding type, which means, and, and that is growing. We see here at the bottom that there is only a little bit of the, of the um, blue. And then here on the top, we see that there is a trend of increasing abra as we go up. Now, um, we wanted to see the magnitude of this ecological change. Is this change something that um, is, go is, is continuing in a, in a, uh, a specific direction? Or is this, uh, or is this the, natural the natural variability of what this, what this ecological system can see? And so to do this, we did a live dead study, right? So we looked at, the sam we looked at seasonal sampling at the live bivalves and compared those to the death assemblages that we found within the core. And so to look at the live assemblages, we looked at the living um, mollusks, uh, the living bivalves that were in the same, the same uh, uh, box core that we took. But because biological um, data is very sporadic, uh, um, the, the, live, uh, the live animals don't, don't uh, uh, live exactly where the core is going to take the sample. They're more sporadic. They're more spread out. Sometimes they live in clusters. And so in order to, um, to enlarge the, the live assemblage, we took a small dredge that also penetrated the, the sediment only five centimeters. So we only took, we only scraped the top sediment and uh, we did that around the, around the sample of the box core. So it was from the same station. We took triplicate uh, small box cores. We took triplicate dredge samples and we looked at all of them. We sieved them also uh, under a two millimeter a two millimeter sip. Uh, we looked at seven, 27 samples and we found there 14 species from about 600 individuals. And so this is also, uh, it, it's a very quantitative uh, way at looking at uh, differences. We don't find just three shells and then say, oh, okay, now we're gonna say what happened in the Eastern Mediterranean. This is um, a, a, a very large numbers, very robust uh, data. And so if we, if we look at the clusters of the seasonal, of the live community samples, of the living community, we see that we found two different clusters that are significantly different. One is the fall winter cluster and the other is the spring summer cluster. And we see there that in the living bivalves and their feeding strategy, we also see a, a significant difference between um, the spring, which has a, a dominant suspension feeding uh, bivalves and the fall cluster, which have this abra, this species that is a mixed feeder and um, is, is dominant in the fall. And so if we look at the season, at the seasonal sampling, we looked at the dead assemblage and there as expected, because the dead assemblage, if you remember I said it was time averaged. And so we don't expect to see the differences in the seasons. We expect to get a big mishmash of everything that uh, gives us um, a, a, a more holistic way of looking at the, at the environment, but it doesn't give 
the, the scale of uh, different um, seasons. And so here we found just one group. And in the live assemblage, as I said, we found, we found these two uh, clusters. And here are the species that are responsible for the differences. And so in the fall, we have only a little bit of the corbula, but the abra, the mixed feeder, is the most dominant. And in the spring, we have suspension feeders. And so if we look at our long-term uh, uh, changes here in the, and so here to the right is going to be the pre Um This is 150 years ago. And as we go to the left, we're, um, we're uh, getting to today. And if we do a live dead study to see, has, has, is the living community very different than the dead community? And that means that there's an anthropogenic difference that happened because of human impact. And so today, it depends. Did we take our samples in the summer or did we take the samples in the winter? And so here we see the blue enlarging and all the way here to the winter. Are, are we going to see today a difference in the ecological parameters on the seafloor? Are today more mixed feeders um, becoming more dominant because there is more, there are more, there's more pollution and more differences that are happening on the seafloor today. And so this is the way that we um, think that we can check, has the ecosystem changed? We can see what is the natural state of the ecosystem? Are, are we today outside the natural variation of the system? And the answer is in the shelly, in the skeletal remains that characterize the historic baseline. Um, and so I don't, do I have like another minute? Let's see, um, not really. Okay, so I just wanna say thank you. And that there's, um, um, uh, I, I, I'm in the middle of a, of a very big project that we're going to look at uh, um, more stations uh, throughout the coast and in different uh, water depths to get the different uh, types of substrate on the seafloor. And we're going to have um, age correlation within all this framework. And if anyone is interested in, being a student or uh, participating in this uh, in this project, please talk to me later. Thank you very much. Ayel, thank you very much for the very nice talk, really. And I'm opening the uh, podium for questions from the audience. Gabriel, I think that you have questions. Wait, am I supposed to say? Uh... No, no, I don't have questions for now. I'm following. <laughs> okay. Weird, Gabriel, you always have questions. It's it. I don't see anybody. So if you have a question, just pop in, okay? Um, first of all, Yael, that was fascinating. Uh, really, really neat stuff. Um, I missed it for a minute. Wait, I, I can't hear you. Can you get closer? It's my, yeah. uh, my, I missed for a minute the location of the calibration, the core that you use for the, for the date calibration of everything. Uh, could, could you show it again, please? It's from the same, uh, from Helzelia 60. We took it right next to the big box core. And... Here we go. Wait, I have to move everything. On. Where is the location? You showed it on the map, no? Ah, it's uh, off Helzelia at 60 meters water depth. So it's right across Helzelia. And we Let's took that because we thought that was uh, far from any specific pollution. We didn't want to go into a specific a local pollution. We wanted to get a, a larger picture of the Eastern Mediterranean. And, 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 and you believe that this would be a similar picture of a sedimentation rate and, and response if we went uh, up and down along the, the coastline? Um, a difference uh, no, uh, I think in 60... And, uh, and, and, and the third? The, okay, so, so first we, we have to really uh, differentiate between south of Haifa and, and north of Haifa. Um, uh, first of all, I, I want to say that we don't know. We don't know what the, the sedimentation rate in the Mediterranean is. We have uh, many, many um, 
are people that tried to get a, a very good sedimentation rate. And I think I think here I I I um I have a protocol that can give us the the correct uh, answer. Um, I think that at 60 meters water depth, this is the sedimentation rate. I think it's going to be different at 40 and different at 100. And this is why um, I'm starting a, a larger project <laughs> um, that, that's going to be looking at 40 meters, at 60 and at 100 at a few different locations uh, along the shore, uh, along the coast. And then of course, to get another, um, another uh, transect like that north of uh, Haifa. So this is a work in progress. This is my first uh, uh, sample that we took and, and I think it shows the potential of, of, of death assemblages and of, of correlating age to our data. And, uh, and, I, and hopefully at the end of the project, I'll be able to give a, a better sense of sedimentation rate in different parts of, of, the, of the Mediterranean. And, and the way I chose my samples were um, in each of the different uh, sediment uh, regimes, not sediment regimes, in, in each of the different substrates. So there's the sandy, the sandy uh, zone and the silty zone and the clay zone. And so I took a sample from each one of those zones and I think that that will give a, a general uh, sedimentation rate for the sandy area and a general sedimentation rate for the clay area. And that's, that's, my, that's my rationale. Um... Would you, did you consider the possibility of lateral transport of, of material? Uh, so, you know, you're familiar, of course, with our work uh, with uh, Liron's uh, core and that shows, uh, that shows that there are turbidites that come from the shelf to yeah. the slope. Did you consider here the possibility of lateral transport? So, um, so I made my life easy. I'm working on the shelf. Um, no big lateral transport that I know of. Um, not, I'm not next to the Carmel uh, fault and I'm not in the slope. And so the, the way that I give constraints on, on, on my data is that I can do a taphonomic um, um, test on the shells to see if they are, uh, if they are uh, local or if they came from far away. And, uh, and, and it seems that they're local. Anyway, in 60, in 60 meters, um, they're definitely local. So you're saying at 60 meters, nothing happens. Really, there is a freeze in, uh, in terms of mobilization. Um, there's local mobilization, but it's local. So things are moving, but they're moving in place. They're not, they're not uh, exotic. They're not, from out of the, they're not from out of the station. They're not, uh, they're not from, far, from far away. That's interesting. Did you did you compare your uh, stations to uh, geophysical data? Did you look at what what the station looked like uh, in, the, in the context of subsurface uh, sedimentation uh, sedimentary structures? So, uh, so this is something that also we're going to do, and I I, I have another station now across Nitz, uh, off Nitzanim and another station off uh, Hedera and and one in the north, and. Uh, and, and the, way we the way we choose our samples, our, our sites, is uh, far away from any um, uh, uh, reches, uh, ridges, underwater, yeah. ridge, uh, uh, far away from, from any ridge, uh, far away from any um, obstruction that we could get in the substrate that would, that would mess up the question. Because we're, we really want to take a step back and look at large and see what's happening so that we can understand the 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 Israeli shore specifically later on. I think we, we have- I think, I think just a second. Have... <laughs> can what, I, can I ask the, something the continuing the same yeah. talk, the same yeah. idea? Yael, um, many studies have pointed that uh, on, already with the slope of uh, two degrees, you may have mobilization of sediment for kilometers, actually. I believe, I don't know what is the slope at 60 meters, of depth, which I believe that we can know that. It's less but than one degree. Less than one degree. But, um, but um, my point is uh, that you could have a mobilization, which doesn't need to be far away, but enough sufficiently far away a little bit to have, um, to call it a mobilization, okay? 
Um, maybe it's something that perhaps you should consider. I mean, I don't know. It's it's they can be local mobilizations also and and uh, not necessarily something massive, but perhaps something to consider. I may say, right? Oh yes. First of all, I should definitely get together with either of you and, and look at your maps and see that I'm not making a, a huge mistake. But um, I think it's a matter of scale, scale of question. So I'm looking at the ecological differences and, and I'm looking at uh, particles that are more than two millimeters uh, large. And so uh, how far can they, how far can they go without uh, leaving marks on the preservation of their shell, which is the taphonomic test that I can do to make sure that, that that the, the mobility isn't uh, far, that the, the, the destruction isn't uh, uh, great. So that I wanted to say is that uh, we already have many seismic sections across high resolution yeah. seismic crisis, uh, sections across the entire shelf. And I'm sure we have some, uh, some of those sections near your uh, lines and we'll be happy to Great. To have the locations and maybe look and, and try to figure out together what it looks like also in the subsurface. Um, so let's talk. Okay. <laughs> I, I open also for other people to ask questions if there are. No, nobody. Pasha, maybe in the room. No. Well, I may ask another one with the uh, LED 210. Um, it's like difficult for me to actually see the peak of uh, the 60s. I don't know. To see what? To see what? The, the peak, the peak of LED 210 in the graph in front of my eyes. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand what you mean, the peak. The peak, you know, I mean, I, maybe I missed it up. Um, but it was for dating, right? The led to, to 210. Yes, yes. The, but I don't file. see the typical peak of the 60s that you, the peak, the high peak of the 60s. I see another, I see a mixed thing over there. I mean. Uh, what's the typical peak? At what, at what then? At as what? much as I remember, but maybe I'm not uh, content with uh, the technique, which I'm not, but I used it several times, but you should have some kind of a uh, very clear peak. Um, or maybe I'm confusing. Well, the, uh, okay, so I, maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe you're thinking about the, the I used LED 10 alpha spectrometry. Uh, the gamma okay. spectrometry has a peak of, uh, of cesium. And yeah, maybe I'm, I'm confusing. So I'm confused. Right, I'm right, right, that. right. So, no so this, so the way you use the alpha spectrometry is, um, you have to have larger samples, and uh, and um, and and it takes longer. It's a longer process, but it's more accurate. And I, I just figured I'd go on the more accurate. <laughs> okay. Um, and and this is what worked for it in a lot for me. And and I, I just, I just think with all the, with all the. Um, the unsureness that we have in the sedimentation rate, it's better to just do it accurately. And, and but okay. yeah, but that's the peak that, that isn't here because in the alpha spectrometer, you don't get a system. Okay. What, what I should do and what I will be doing in, in the next um, course that we're taking is uh, to calibrate it with the uh, with, uh, C14, just to have one more point that we can. All right, would be great. Yeah. Yes, and so that's, that's the next process. Okay. Well, if no more questions, so we should close it. Okay. Uh, yeah, would you like to remain in touch with us for the next seminars? Just let me know. Okay. And thank then we will send you notifications, you know? Excellent. So thank you very much. I uh, really you. appreciate it again. Um, and uh, hope to see you soon in person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Bye, enjoy the cookies. Enjoy the cookies. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody.